Okay, welcome everybody. Georgian Peaks, another movie night. You guys must be sick of seeing some of us by now um, doing these series of movie events, but uh, we have a very special occasion today. Um, but firstly, hey, we're back on snow and we're skiing. How fun is that? Conditions have been epic. Uh, I'm sure you would agree. Uh, it's just been great to be on, on snow and, and seeing you all at safe distance, of course, and um, just having a great time. Um, so Georgian Peaks, you know, I mean, it's such a magical place. It's, it's a place that we all uh, hold near and dear. I think one of the hardest things right now is this whole social component, right? I mean, we are, we are a vibrant social club. We, we ski hard. We, we play hard. Uh, it's all about family. Um, you know, but right now, really got to make sure we remind ourselves to push the pause button on the social aspect. So it's events like these, you know, kind of the Zoom format that still allows us to connect, celebrate, have fun, you know, have a drink and, um, and to connect in whatever way we can. So thanks so much for all of your patience as we've been going uh, through what has been an unprecedented year. Uh, you guys have been awesome and let's continue to be awesome and let's really work and, and help our staff uh, help us to make this a successful season, right? Really implore you to be patient and work with our, our staff uh, as, as they aim to keep everyone safe uh, in the lodge, out on the hill, getting on the chairlift. Hey, even I got into some trouble masking up, getting on the chairlift today. So no one's off limits. Uh, and if you're that person on the deck with a beer uh, standing, you can't do that. You got to be seated. You have to be seated uh, in order to enjoy a drink uh, with your family unit. So uh, please work with us on that and uh, we appreciate it. So movie night is, you know, uh, has been about uh, history. And of course, you know, Georgian Peaks is uh, steeped in tradition and we honor our past. And tonight, today, commemorates 60 years ago today that the Beehive Invitational Giant Slalom was hosted on our hills, uh, specifically on Thunderhead and Thunder Run. Um, so this was a really big deal at the time, going back 60 years ago. The club had just opened its doors in December of 1960. And this race was held uh, February 26, 1961. So just a few months later, um, you know, there was some, there was some challenges. It, uh, but interestingly, it hosted some of the best racers in the world, like really big racers. So, uh, so we're gonna get into that in a little bit, but what I would like to remind everyone is that this was probably one of the first early examples of our, our community, our Peaks community coming together uh, and working through adversity to make something really special, special happen. Sounds kind of like this year, you know, 60 years later, uh, but just kind of different contexts. So joining me uh, on tonight's call and, and movie presentation is uh, Sonia uh, Hamilton. And uh, she's the uh, co-commissioner of Adult House League uh, alongside with my brother. And we also have our head coach, um, commander in chief uh, on ski racing, uh, Tomas Sank. So, so guys, 60 years ago, we hosted this race. I mean, we, we know we've heard some of the stories about the challenges, uh, right? Like there was a real lack of snow. Sonia, what, what are some of the things you've heard through your circles? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the weather was cer is certainly the first thing and the conditions are certainly the first thing that, uh, that everybody mentions. Um, you can all have a look at my background here. This is actually a photo of uh, the lodge in Georgian Peaks in early 1960s. And from what I hear, the conditions on uh, the day of the Beehive event weren't much different than what's in the photo. Um, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, a lack of snow was, was certainly a huge issue. Uh, I think that uh, what I, the other major resounding theme that I've heard from so many people is, is the, uh, the resilience of the team and the courage it took to actually put on a world-class ski event at a brand new club that um, the planning process would have started well before the club had 
a single operating day and that um, our founders found the not only the courage but the energy to uh, to go on and and then and plan this event it's uh, I definitely wouldn't call it a soft launch launch of a brand new uh, club. Right. So yeah. Um, so yeah. as I, as I understand it, they raised a purse of three thousand five hundred dollars for for the race for the winners to attract the talent. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I think that largely was sponsored by Beehive Corn Syrup, which uh, the three of us have brought. Yeah a sampling of that we will talk about a little bit more later but yeah the $3,500 uh, purse and remember that's in 1961 dollars so um in in today doll in today today's dollars that's a lot of money yeah because first prize was $1,500 you know right. in 1961 yeah $1,500 in 1961 and uh just with a little bit of research uh in 1960 the average household income was $1,700. So that sort of gives you a, a sense of how, how big that first prize really was. Right. Yeah. Crazy. So they, they put a lot of, they, they organized a, a purse. It attracted uh, talent and there was this massive, massive kind of weather issue, right? I mean, I can only imagine the stress leading up to the race as they had planned this. And, uh, as I understand it, they had to more or less have snow brought in and dug out of the bushes. I had heard that they had used coal chutes uh, that they use for mining in order to dig and, and, and move snow and basically organize a, a swath down the run that was like 12 feet wide or something to that effect. I can't even imagine. You yeah, know. I, I heard it was a major operation. And um, I've also heard from some of our uh, earlier members that, you know, all of the, the, the founding members, they took days off work, they came up uh, from the city or, or wherever they were located and were moving snow out of out of the uh, forest, according to uh, Joyce Kirby with cocktails and cigarettes in hand. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that as you do, as you as do, you do right. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and I think it was a broader community effort too. I remember from the stories on the uh, from the hill uh, video that was done a couple of years ago uh, by Blair Lock. Um, you know, Jake Robbins, who, who who's a founding well, he's very very senior and one of the founding members over at Osler, I believe. He said that everyone went over to the peaks for this. Like it was a community, like broad community. Everyone came over. Everyone pitched in. So I think it's super cool. Yeah, very cool. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you when you look at the track, that's going to be the cool part of this video, just to see the amount of work that went in to put possibly about a foot of snow in the track, right. about 15 feet wide. Is that what we established there? Maybe something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And what I understand, too, is it had been rain and it had been very mild and then overnight flash freeze, like overnight for the race flash freeze. So it was kind of like you know, it was, it was just an, an ice rink basically. So, so that gives us an idea of kind of the, uh, you know, the terrain and, and, and the race and the challenges that, you know, and like I say, that kind of the community work that went into making it possible, which I think is, makes it ultra special. Sonia, what did you learn about the racer profiles? Cause this really did attract the best in the world. Like this was no uh, Mickey Mouse kind of lineup. No, not at all. And in, in, in fact, it, it attracted the very best in the world. So um, having done a, a bit of research on the on the start list, I mean, it doesn't get any better than the, than the people that came uh, to the beehive race. So for example, um, in Kitzbühel, there's a there's a group called the Kitzbühel Wonder Team. It was a group of six guys. They all raced World Cup. And in between 1950 and 1960, they won uh, 27 Olympic and world champion medals between the six of them. Of those six, three of them were at the Beehive race at Georgian Peaks. Uh, and so we had Tony Seiler for, is, is one of them. Now, Tony actually didn't race in the Beehive because he wanted to maintain his amateur status. I think he was a bit younger than some of the guys and was still racing um, on... on it, on the in the amateur uh, league, right? Andrew Moulter, Christian Pravda, 
Um, these guys are, are big names and they, you know, in the 1952 Olympics, Christian uh, won a silver in the GS, bronze in the downhill. These are all guys who podiumed at the Olympics or at world championships. We've got Stein Erickson, who um, most people are familiar with the name Stein Erickson, or at least his hair, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the 1952 Olympics, he's, he won gold in GS, silver in slalom, and he won three, girl, three gold medals at the 1954 World Championships. So this is the caliber we had. And then we also had, you know, a number of people from our Canadian ski community. We had Ernie McCullough, arguably one of the biggest names in, in Canadian ski history. Um, he went on to, uh, to have a very distinguished coaching career uh, that recently there was an article that Escarpment Magazine put out that uh, featured uh, some background on, on Ernie. Uh, we also had, we had Art Tommy, um, Andy Tommy Foran. That's, uh, those are the Tommies from Tommy and Lefebvre in Ottawa. So yep. uh, again, a very, very prominent ski family in Canada. Um, and my, my father was also in the race. So Hans Wieland, our first ski school director at Georgian Peaks, new to the role, obviously, because the club was brand new, uh, also entered the race. And I'm proud to sport his bib starting bid number 16 you'll see him in the video uh and uh he can certainly attest to the fact that it was a pretty bumpy course yeah. uh he, he said that many times so that's uh, yeah, awesome so big names that's awesome now who else was in it uh, uh, did i hear correctly buck rogers uh w took a crack at it too uh no i don't think buck did but buck was uh uh chief of race for oh, okay for the beehive yeah so uh, he was certainly a big part of organizing and uh, making sure it, it it happened so tomas that would be like uh you know if i was a, a ski instructor which i'm not i should not be either but that would be me like well i'm gonna race with marshall hirscher and uh bay at foyts and uh yeah i'll have a go <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wouldn't be easy that's for sure you'd be humbled pretty quick I you know so. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's awesome, Sonia. So Tomas, based on, I mean, you've seen the video. Tell, tell us a bit like, I, I mean, this is antiquated stuff. I know that like, but talk about the course set and what you see in terms of the conditions and the saf the safety or lack thereof. <laughs> well, yeah, things have come along uh, quite a ways in, in 60 years. You look at uh, the course there, you know, 15 feet of snow, roughly about six to a foot feet now you have to have full snow control 40 meters wide fencing um i think the safety feature back then was uh frozen hay bales and uh and whatever could stop you and maybe you a down. maybe a cocktail in the toboggan as they take you down maybe but it's just interesting to watch the technique and you know and look at the equipment they had and how were they they were able to maneuver that stuff that's the cool part in all this Right. Oh, you see their knee pushed into the hill a little bit more in order for the ski to turn over. You see when they put a, a couple of delays in there that go right through the bush most with a nice, uh, it looks like, I don't know, maybe 15 feet wide. So it's really cool to see the, the hill. And they're going in and out of the ditch because there wasn't much snow. Nothing was flat. Um, and to watch them go through that, it was, it was a lot of fun to go through it. I think people will find this really interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And and so what I understand is the course had 28 gates. Um, and I think there was a few double or triple delays, like, you know, they're traversing all over the place. And uh, some closed panels too, like you don't see that in GS anymore, like the closed panel GS. Not as much as they used to. I think they, they were just trying to figure their way down. So right. they came down Thunder from what it looked like and over to the bottom of Bay Street, then over to Champlain. Um, that's kind of, I think I'm right, uh, Sonia, with that type of course set. And, and I think back then there was, there was a few little alleys where they had to sneak people through. It wasn't as wide the whole way down. When you see the video, you can see that the thunder is pretty wide. And but as they come down to now Lower Rogers um, and then over to Champlain, they kind of zig through the bush there a little bit with, and they're using the delays and the closed gates to make the, the racers go through there. Yeah. So imagine there was a lot of uh, inspection as they were going through there to see who had the best line. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I took, uh, I took a run or two down thunder and thunderhead, uh, today, this afternoon. And I was mindful of that 60 years ago, these guys were, uh, you know, risking it all heading, heading down and certainly conditions today would have been welcome, I think, versus what they dealt with, uh, you yeah. know, that, that very much uh, looks like Sonia's background right now, basically no snow. How, how are we going to do this? So why don't we show the movie? I'll, I'll show it now and then we can kind of regroup and I'm sure there'll be a lot of chestnuts that we can dig up and talk about. Um, and for, for some of you that haven't seen this and you kids too, that are fans of racing, you might have a laugh because, you know, 60 years, I think as you're watching this, what it will have you think is, what are people going to think 60 years from now when they see my video of me skiing, you know, will things look this different? So, um, all right, so I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to play it. And then we are going to uh, chat on the, uh, on the other side of this. So grab some popcorn and cozy up and we will, um, we will see you on the other side of this. Beehive Golden Corn Syrup presents the first professional beehive giant slalom being held at Georgian Peaks, located on the southern shores of Georgian Bay, between the towns of Collingwood and Thornbury in the province of Ontario, Canada. This is the first race ever scheduled where the greatest names of the skiing world will compete for more than $4,000 in cash prizes. The race will be held on Georgian Peak's famous Thunder Run, three quarters of a mile long and a 770 foot vertical drop. Entered to compete in the Beehive Giant Slalom are such world famous names as Austria's Tony Spies, Andro Motorer, Christian Pravda, Norway's Stein Eriksson and Sigurd Rockney, Canada's Ernie McCullough, and a host of other top names from the United States and Canada. This is truly the first time that the great names in the world of skiing will compete for cash prizes. Excitement is running feverishly high among the competitors and the 10,000 spectators who have turned out to witness this great event. The forerunner is on the course. Andy Tommy of Ottawa and former Canadian Olympic and FIS skier and holder of a number of Canadian championships. Andy has spent three days on the mountain planning and experimenting with this course. He finally settled for only 28 gates in the three-quarter mile run. A smooth, fast type of course, looking deceptively easy, featuring a great deal of rhythmic skiing. But woe to the competitor who gets slightly off the required line because he will be in trouble. Now, that heart-stopping moment. The first runner leaps out of the starting gate, Tony Spies of Austria. In 1952, Spies won a bronze medal in the Olympic giant slalom. And in 1957 and 58, was appointed Austrian national ski coach. Now in the traverse, Spies' line seems to be low. This may affect his time. In this top international competition, one error in judgment can lose the race. Everybody waits for the first official time. It's 55 and 8 tenths seconds. And now Christian Pravda, one of the greatest Austrian racers and dominant figures in ski racing in the last 10 years. In the 1952 Olympics, Pravda won a silver medal in giant slalom and a bronze in the downhill. In 1959, he was winner of the national giant slalom at Squaw Valley. Pravda holds permanent possession of the prestigious Harriman Cup, winning it three times in 1953, 56, and 59. He skis so effortlessly that he appears to be having a slow run. He took the traverse high, and he was able to tuck into a good racing crouch. His time, 55-2. Otmar Schneider, another top Austrian. Winner of a coveted gold medal for slalom in the 1952 Olympics and a silver medal for downhill. He was a member of the Austrian national ski team from 1948 to 1956 and was appointed coach of the 1960 
Austrian Olympic team. His speed is deceptive. Notice Schneider doesn't get into a real crouch while crossing the traverse. His time, 55.7. Just five tenths of a second slower than Paul. It's anybody's race. Andrew Motor of Austria powers his way down the course. Motor is from Kitzbühel, the Blitz from Kitz. He's won many European competitions. In 1953, he was winner of the International Giant Slalom at Stowe. And in 1955, the Harriman Cup. In 1956, Motor won an Olympic silver medal in Giant Slalom and a bronze medal in Downhill. This looks like a fast run. Fifty-five zero. The best time recorded so far, beating Pravda by two tenths of a second. And now the breathtaking Stein Eriksson of Norway, winner of a gold medal in the 1952 Olympics in giant slalom and a silver in slalom. He won another gold for the combined. Normally, a great stylist, Stein seems to be sacrificing style for speed. Let's wait and see. Erickson's time, 53 and 8 tenth seconds. He beats Motor by 1 and 2 tenth seconds for the fastest time in the first run. And now Ernie McCullough of Canada, the emotional favorite, coming out of seven years of retirement and competition. He's down. In this top international field, that will be the end of McCullough's hopes for a victory. The long months of training wasted. Always a tenacious competitor, he's still out to make a good showing. In 1956, the press voted McCullough skier of the half century. He has won every major skiing competition in the United States and Canada. A living legend in Canadian skiing. Here is Ernie McCullough's disastrous fall in slow motion. It appears that he caught an uphill edge the veteran McCullough was trying too hard. In spite of his spill, his time is a remarkable 59 and 6 tenths. Art Tommy, Canadian Olympian from Ottawa, skiing on an ankle, injured in practice. Tommy, a powerful skier, seems to be having trouble with his timing. He hooks the flag and is down. The ski patrol to the rescue. Now, Sigurd Rockney on the course. A young Norwegian, comparatively unknown in North America. A protege of Stein Eriksson. Rockney has won the Norwegian championships three times. He is a stylist in the Ericsson tradition. A dark horse today, he holds his line well through the flags. The rough terrain has him fighting as he goes through the traverse. The best time so far in the first run, Ericsson of Norway with 53 and 8 tenths, followed by Motorer of Austria, 55 even, and Christian Pravda, 55 and 2 tenths. Rockney's time puts him in sixth place in the first run. 
Franz Gobel, a silver medal winner for slalom in the 1948 Olympics. He learned his skiing in St. Anton in the Austrian Tyrol. Higher on the course, Gobble has missed a gate. This disqualifies him from the second run. Johnny Fripp, the great Canadian racer from Ottawa, former coach of Canadian FIS teams. His competitive record spans a quarter of a century. Twice winner of the Quebec Kandahar, and winner of the Alta Snow Cup. He is placed in a host of other Canadian championships. Hans Eder, a former member of the Austrian national team and now a resident of Toronto, Canada. Eder is one of the few recognized four event men in the world being at one time the top jumping and cross-country competitor from the Alpine countries. From Switzerland, Fritz Channon, former holder of the world ski flying record and coach of the Swiss national jumping team. He now directs the ski school at Chalet Cochon, St. Margaret's, Quebec. From the 1960 Canadian Olympic team, Jean Lessard, Promise de Quebec. From Owen Sound, Ontario, former Canadian FIS team member Jim Georges, a member of the famous Georges skiing family. Hans Wieland of Austria, head of the ski school here at Georgian Peaks. Bill Irwin from Fort William, Ontario, many times Western Canadian champion. He represented Canada at the 1948 Olympics. Now Red McConville from London, Ontario, holder of many provincial honors. Red is late on his turn. He's down a very fast recovery. McConville was formerly a ski instructor at Mont-Tremblant, Quebec. And he's putting on a sterling performance today. Bill Georges, another member of the famous Owen Sound skiing family, always a top contender. He is followed by Edward Popovich from Windsor, Ontario, who does most of his competitive skiing in the highlands of Michigan. Now in mid-course, Pierre Mayotte, Ski School Director at Limberlost Lodge, Huntsville, Ontario. Here's Paul Williams of Cadillac, Michigan, and holder of United States Midwest Championship. Don Holding of Toronto, Assistant Director of Georgian Peaks Ski School. And the last contender of the first run, Mario Fontana of Windsor, Ontario. The competitors preparing for the second run have been feverishly changing waxes. The snow conditions have changed radically in the midday sun. There goes Ericsson of Norway up for his second run in the Beehive Giant Slalom. He leads Motorer of Austria by one and two tenths seconds, followed by Pravda, Schneider and Spies, all of Austria. Then Rockney of Norway, then the two top Canadians, McCullough and Fripp. The first five runners' times are within two seconds of each other. 
the burning question. Will Stein Erickson, with a convincing lead from the first run, play it safe? Or will he throw caution to the winds and go all out for the big purse? Now, so that you can see this historic ski race in minute detail, the second run will be shown in super slow motion. Space is off. Making movement count, he thrusts out of the starting gate. One of the all-time great Austrian racers, Spies is at his spectacular best in this second run. Watch how he, like all top competitors today, will step uphill as he comes through this gate. is now an instructor at Aspen, Colorado. Fifty-three and seven-tenths, shaving his first run by more than two seconds. World-renowned Christian Pravda poised in the starting gate. The slow-motion camera catches the smooth efficiency that has made him, at age 34, one of the most respected competitors in the world today. Pravda is now teaching skiing at the Sun Valley Ski School in Sun Valley, Idaho. into his crouch with his skis tracking straight and fast across the traverse. His time, 53-4, almost two seconds faster than his first run. Otmar Schneider, Austrian Olympic champion and coach, now racing instructor in the ski school at Mount Mansfield, Stowe, Vermont. Schneider was in fourth position at the end of the first run. Less than two seconds behind Erickson, who had the fastest time. One of the big benefits that professional ski racing will generate is in improved ski techniques. A top racer, in his attempt to shave tenths of seconds, improvises. When this proves to be successful, techniques and teaching methods change. One of the techniques now being adopted by many instructors is the step turn. All of the top competitors here are using the step turn. Watch how the weight is stepped over onto the outside ski a little sooner and the heel of the new inside ski is lifted. The tip remains on the snow with just enough pressure to keep it there. This maneuver puts the maximum weight on the outside ski when most needed and provides a fast, virtually skidless way of turning.
52.9. All of the runners up till now have been almost two seconds faster than on their first run. And now, Andro Motorer, the blitz from Kitts, placing second in the first run. He will be going all out to make up that one and two tenth seconds difference between his time and Erickson's in the first run. Motorer is now instructing in the Aspen Ski School, Aspen, Colorado. To show how keen the competition is today, the four Austrians placing immediately behind Erickson are all within eight tenths of a second of each other. No margin for error in this top group of international competitors gathered here today at Georgian Peaks for the first professional Beehive Giant Slalom. Watch how the step turn results in a positive weight shift. The stepping motion is a natural and faster one and simplifies body movement. ties with Pravda on the second run, but he has the fastest combined time. Canada's great Ernie McCullough had a disastrous fall in his first run, but the same phenomenal competitive spirit that lifted McCullough to the top of the ski world now challenges him to shoot it all or nothing for the fastest single run of the day. but he's up again quickly. Ernie McCullough is the director of the famous Mont-Tremblant Ski School at Mont-Tremblant, Quebec, and chief examiner of the Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance. McCullough's return to competitive skiing after seven years of retirement pays off in the veterans class. And now, the winner of the first run, the incomparable Stein Erickson of Norway. Erickson has to go all out. He no longer has a safe margin because almost every competitor preceding him in the second run has bettered his first run time. It has been said that most champions skiing on a crowded hill are indistinguishable from the crowd, but not Stein. He stands out like a solid gold Cadillac. Erickson is a national hero in his homeland. He is now ski school director at both Aspen Highlands in Colorado and Boyne Mountain, Michigan. The crowd of over 10,000 lining the whole course is absolutely silent as the drama unfolds.
Erickson is pouring it on all the way down the course with all the daring and confidence of a true champion. His judgment seems to have paid off also because his skis seem to be particularly fast. Erickson's time, 52.3, the fastest time of the day. The race is over. The officials are totaling the times, and the crowd gathers for the prize giving. On hand to congratulate the winners is Tony Seiler, winner of three gold medals in the 1956 Olympics and the FIS World Championships in 1959. And Miss Beehive, also Lauren Gray of the St. Lawrence Starch Company, sponsors of the Beehive Giant Slalom. The makers of Beehive Golden Corn Syrup sponsored this historic ski race because of its close association with athletes in all sports who use this great energy food. Ernie McCullough, who in spite of a bad fall, placed a remarkable seventh overall and first in the veterans class, receives a check for $600. Sigurd Rockney of Norway, who placed sixth Tony Spies, placing fifth, gets his reward. Christian Pravda, in a tie for third place with Otmar Schneider, both receive $500. Pravda and Schneider were just two-tenths of a second slower than Andrew Motorer, who takes a well-earned second place and a purse of $800. And now the champion, the winner of the first professional Beehive Giant Slalom and the $1,500 purse is Stein Erickson, the champion today against a field of great champions. His combined time was two and three tenths seconds faster than Motorer in second place. The meet here at Georgian Peaks has been a tremendous success, a giant step in the exciting and fast developing world of competitive skiing. So, you know what has not changed in 60 years? Well, the terrain hasn't changed. The hill is still the same, Thunder Run. And uh, Georgian Peak still puts on great races, right? I mean, even just as, as recent as last year, we had, uh, we had the Norams and, uh, and it was just epic. Like we just delivered on, on all fronts there. And another thing is we didn't talk about the crowds. I mean, there was between 8,000 and 10,000 people there uh, reported. So everyone came out for, for the, this historic event. So now we, you know, we got to observe a few things. And Tomas, I got to ask you, so like, uh, you know, race technique and, and stuff, what do you think, uh, you know, what comments would you share? And what, what did we learn by going super slow motion in that second run? <laughs> well, there's been a lot of buzz going on about the step turn. Um, what my recommendation would be, if you have to do a step turn in this day and age, you probably got a little bit too low, but it still could be effective at some point. So, but overall, you know, you watch these guys and, and the equipment they're using and how they're able to hold an edge, you know, and the technique they're using, it, it's pretty cool. You see a lot of uh, things we're doing today. The one thing I do want to mention is, Something hasn't changed. It's 100% on the outside ski. They talked a little bit about that. Still very much today. Um, you saw a lot of double pole plant in there. I don't know if you guys noticed that. But we, oh, still, yeah. use, we still use that for a little bit of timing and, and pole planting as well. So 
you know what? It, there's, a, there's a few things that are similar except for the equipment and uh, the courses and everything else, but uh, it's cool to watch um, and how things have evolved so much over the years. What do you think, Son? Yeah, I mean, it's great, great to watch. Um, I love the technique. Uh, one thing, you know, as an observation on many of the racers is not, uh, not all of them are wearing goggles. Uh, some of them are. My father, for example, had goggles on his head, but it appears that he forgot to put them down in the first run. So uh, I, I find that a bit interesting. I'm not sure how we'd get away with that today. So, yeah, so was this, was this back in the day where goggles were slow? Is that, is what, that what I take away from this? I think they might've been slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were some good goggles too. Cause uh, I think it was Christian Pravda that looked like Hunter S Thompson with the yellow uh, blue blocker kind of goggle. I'd kill for those goggles. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. And then the, the ski poles, I mean, I think I could get an, you know, at least a half second on, on my time with the, you know, doing the pole flick at the finish line with these five <laughs> foot ski poles. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I agree. I think that would be, that's the key there. They're getting across the finish line before anybody you got a, you got an extra meter there. Yeah, yeah exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, but you can certainly see the talent in the uh, in the group, right? I, I dare us to have a uh, a retro adult house league race and everybody wear the equipment that those guys were wearing and see how we'll do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think there'd be a lot of people interested in, in doing that, um, for sure. Now, let's talk about who's faster. Well, we know who was faster, but which is a faster look? Stein Erickson's glorious hair or Ernie McCullough's helmet, which is, which is really fast. Stein Erickson's hair only it, because it's right. Stein Erickson and he won, uh, he won. So clearly his hair is faster than Ernie's it, helmet. You're right, right. His hair is faster for sure. That helmet, that helmet's something else. I don't know how much protection it would actually uh, give you, but uh, that hair, it was much faster for sure. Yeah, now, now on, that, on that point though, the, the commentator does make this, this comment about style and, you know, Erickson, the great stylist. I mean, you know, Tom, as you're working with the kids, do you say, yeah, you were super fast, you won, but you know, you, the style was no good. <laughs> Try Come not on. to quote it. <laughs> There's always style. It's hard to be stylish these days. You got to get the helmet. You got to get the POC helmet and the, the sweet helmet and make sure uh, all that part of it looks good for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I wouldn't want to be uh, trying to maneuver those skis, though. They look like battleships. Like, well, I can't imagine. Like, even the weight of it right here, when I'm looking at this binding and everything else, like, it's just, I don't know how they bent it. No yeah. idea. Yeah, the, the other thing I was going to bring up uh, is just that, uh, I don't know about you, but when I think about music that I want to hear in my head when I'm racing, it doesn't sound like, like this. You know, like, I don't know. I don't know if they're playing this in the start hut at Kitzbühel, you know? So uh, anyway, I guess it was, it was fast back then. I, I don't know. All right. Yeah, I guess the other thing I would add too, is it, is it am I learning now that a giant slalom is actually pronounced giant slalom as, as, the, uh, as the announcer did there? Yeah, I think that's evolved over the years. So slalom is, you know, that's that's the faster term. Right. That's that's how long it that's how long ago it was. Yeah, well, super cool. Um, so you know what we gotta do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just what a couple more things I just wanted to, you know, kind of mention and as observations. We've I've heard um, a few different stories from uh, from some of our GP60 uh members and 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 their children you know we've had uh resoundingly everybody talks about certainly the weather which we discussed before my understanding is uh don and ruth campbell for example had a party after the race and invited some of the racers over in true peaks fashion so i would say that's something that has not changed in 60 years um it, you know we've had we had some 
uh, tales from from Anne Boyd Skinner, from the, the Kirby's, of course, and uh, my mother also. Apparently, uh, you know, the beehive doesn't happen without a little bit of romance. So there's definitely talk about a beehive Romeo that was out there that uh, three of our GP60 female <laughs> members recalled and cited so he must have been quite an unforgettable man uh awesome <laughs> yeah so um definitely some great stories and it's certainly great to honor um that generation and that group of people who worked so incredibly hard to to make this happen and and it, it, at the same time as opening a brand new private ski club so i think that's pretty impressive yeah, absolutely. And as you rightly pointed out, like even looking at that, that uh, background that you have, it was a new lodge back then and we got a new lodge now, you know, it's like the 60 year, you know, the generational gap. It's a 60 year cycle. <laughs> right. Yeah. Crazy. Any other little nuggets or stories? Not for me. I think, uh, yeah, I think it was a great event. Yeah. Tomas, sure. did you did your dad have any uh, you know stories or, or memories from from what he hear, heard about this race? I, I mean, I think it was before his time a bit. Yeah, he wasn't at the peaks yet. I think he joined in '75. Right. Um, and uh, but uh, the one thing his takeaway, I think, from uh, Tony Spees is if anybody's been with uh, Marion, they know they're doing Spees. Doesn't matter how old. It's either the Texas two step or speaks. So thank you, Tony. That was my childhood. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, we all did a fair bit of that. And so now you can put a face to the terrible exercise. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. Well, good. I, so what I'd like to suggest is, um, as, as the commentator rightly said, I, apparently this stuff, the beehive corn syrup, is um, breakfast of champions uh, basically, or this is like the old Red Bull? Because they said that athletes in all sports use this great energy food. <laughs> so I think what we should do, just like uh, some of the participants, is is maybe have a little taste. What do you think? Let's do it. Cheers, you guys. Ready? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh, dirty. <laughs> lord all right wow delicious <laughs> yeah that's pure calories uh i'm gonna have to remember to bring this to our adult house league races so that you know we can maximize yeah. energy on course i think they'd be pretty happy to know 60 years later from sponsoring a, a race at georgian peaks they're still getting a plug although i don't know about that <laughs> So listen, thank you everyone for, for dialing in. Thank you, uh, Sonia and Tomas for comments and joining alongside me for, you know, what's a historical day. And I think it's, it's not just a race that happened a long time ago. I think it's acknowledging the history um, of the club, you know, back at, at, a, at a huge, uh, you know, uh, point in time where the club was just getting up and running and, and developing its family and understanding what that family looked like and what community meant. And then, you know, not dissimilarly having to overcome, you know, some challenges to make, make things work. That's exactly where we're at today, right? So let's persevere. Let's make this work uh, is, my, is my ask of you. And, um, you know, Peaks is a special place and uh, we're going to enjoy it years, uh, years to come. And uh, let's celebrate, you know, 60 years of skiing at Georgian Peaks and, uh, you know, hope to see you all out on, on the hill this weekend. And want to really thank you all for uh, for uh, dialing in for this. So uh, thanks and be well, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, everyone. See you, everyone.